as we are picking up in our series as we continue going through the book of Acts. Um, and, and so last week, as we looked at, at where were we at, we looked at the calling of the first disciple, of the first deacons, rather, to serve in the church. And, and as we pick up, one of the things that becomes clear when you go through the book of Acts, there are sections and there are verses you want to talk about and look at um, that it, you can't really talk about it unless you have almost the whole chapter before. And so we're going to be in the verses 51 through 60 of chapter 7, but we have to kind of talk about what happened in the beginning of chapter 7. So we looked at, as I mentioned, uh, the first deacons that were called within the church. And one of those men was named Stephen. And the Bible talks about Stephen, describes him as a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And right after this passage, we read um, about how you can see in, in chapter the end of chapter 6 and in chapter 7, how Stephen is performing great wonders and signs among all the people. And because of this, uh, some of the Jews who were opposed to those who were following Christ began to argue with Stephen, but he was consistently winning those arguments. And because of this, they began to spread rumors and convinced others to spread rumors as well that he was speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. This got everyone stirred up, and he was eventually taken before the Sanhedrin, these are the same people who had arrested and dealt with Peter and John earlier in, in the book of Acts that we looked at. And they said they were, he was speaking against the temple and, that Je, and saying that Jesus was going to destroy the temple and change the customs of Moses. And then when the Sanhedrin looked at him, the Bible says that his face looked like the face of an angel. So the Sanhedrin asks him if this is true. And Stephen then preaches a powerful sermon to all who are in attendance. He basically goes through a crash course of the Old Testament up into, well, up into where they are at that point. He speaks of God's promises to Abraham to give him land and a people. He tells, him that, he tells how God tells Abraham that his people would be enslaved for 400 years and then receive their promise. He talks about the sign of circumcision that was given to Abraham. He talks about Isaac and Jacob and, and Joseph, who through whom they found provision in Egypt. He talks about their enslavement in Egypt. And how Moses was saved from the genocide of the, the boys his age and, and takes them out and leads them out. He talks about Moses' murder of the Egyptian in exile and then coming back and leading the people out of Egypt. He talks about the people's unfaithfulness to God and refusal to listen to Moses. He talks about Joshua and David and how God's hand is on the people constantly and how oftentimes the people fail. How Solomon built the temple Stephen then asserts that the Most High does not dwell in sanctuaries that are made by hands. And, and picking up at this point in this long sermon is where we are right now in Acts chapter 7, verses 51 through 60, if you'll read along. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are always resisting the Holy Spirit as your ancestors did also. Did you do also? Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You received the law under the direction of angels and yet have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were enraged and gnashed their teeth at him. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They yelled at the top of their voices, covered their ears, and, dra and together rushed against them. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he died. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together this morning. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, this day that we can come together and look at your word. We thank you that you have given us your word, that you've revealed us, you've revealed to us who you are. You've shown us how you've worked and how you've moved and given us an example to follow and warnings to avoid. And God, I pray that today as we look at this passage, we can look at our own lives and we can see how we are living and we can see how it lines up to what you would call us to do and who you would call us to be. God, I pray that as we examine ourselves, we would, we would just seek to, gr to know you more. We would seek to run to you and away from the things of this world. God, I pray that you'd be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So what we see here, the first thing we see in this passage is the identifying of sin. We see that, the identi- we, see that we need to be identifying sin. This passage starts with Stephen calling those listening a stiff-necked people. Now, this is not a new thing for those hearing. Throughout the Old Testament, God referred to the people of Israel as a stiff-necked people. And at its core, it means stubborn. It invokes the image, or it would for these people, an image of an ox that refused to be led and is stiff-necked. That ox is not living its purpose and is not useful for work. And in the same way, the people of Israel refused to live into their purpose when God called them stiff-necked. When oxen will not cooperate, they must be disciplined and trained to following, follow instructions to meet their task. And this is why we often see God discipline His people so they will remember what they're supposed to be doing. For us today, probably the most uh, relatable example of what it means to be stiff-necked is if you've ever tried to walk a dog that refuses to walk nicely on a leash. It pulls and pulls and insists on going its own way. And that's the same idea of being stiff-necked, a people that refuse to listen and insist on going their own way. That's what he's saying to them, you stiff-necked people. And so in many ways, he's saying, you're just like your ancestors. He, we'll get into that further. He then says they have uncircumcised hearts and ears. And so we mentioned in his service sermon previous to this, he talks about Abraham and the covenant God made with Abraham, the covenant of circumcision, this thing that separated them from the people that would make them be his people because they were in covenant with God. But what he tells them is that their hearts are uncircumcised. They may have heard the law. They may uh, be in appearance doing the right things, but they have not let God's covenant in law be written upon their hearts. With their hearts, they don't know God. They only appear to know God. With their ears, they don't listen to God. They just proclaim to know and listen to God. So what Stephen is saying here is they may outwardly appear to follow God. Their hearts are far from him because they've not listened to his word. He says they are always resisting the Holy Spirit just like their ancestors. This is the evidence that they are truly far from God. They are resisting the things that God is doing. You cannot resist what God is seeking to do in your life and in the world around you and claim to be following him. They are resisting the Holy Spirit. This was why Stephen led with the history of of, of Israel to show the disobedience of their ancestors, how they had resisted in times past what God was doing. When God led them through Moses into into the desert, in the wilderness, They resisted everything God was doing. When all of these other people were leading, when the prophets prophesied and spoke about the coming Messiah, they killed them. And he's telling them, all of these things that you would agree with and point to and say were wrong, you continue to do the very same things. Because the the Sanhedrin, those listening, would not have disagreed with Stephen. They know that what their ancestors did was wrong. They know that Moses was seeking to lead God's people, and the people were being stiff-necked. They would know that. They would agree with that. They failed to see, however, how they were doing the same thing. Stephen's point is that they are just like them. Their ancestors persecuted the prophets and killed the prophets who spoke about the Messiah, and they themselves have killed the Messiah. They are the very same as their ancestors. He tells them that they have had the law, but have not kept it. They knew what the law said. They knew that the law foretold of the Messiah. They knew all of this, but rather than obeying the law and receiving the Messiah, they murdered him. All of Stephen's sermon up to this point is a clear explanation and indictment of the sin of all those who are listening. He wanted to be very clear to them that they are opposed to God. They are in sin, far from him. And it's it's a very similar accusation that Peter levied in his sermon at Pentecost, that they have killed the one whom God has sent. He's explaining their sin to them and explaining that they are guilty before God. This is a message that we all must understand. Here's the reality. We were not there at the time. We were not the ones that were actively opposing Jesus' ministry as these were walking around seeking to to trip him up. We weren't those people. We didn't offer money for his betrayal as the Sanhedrin did. We did not hand him over to Pontius Pilate as they did. We did not shout crucify him as they did. We did not mock him 
while he was on the cross. However, we are just as guilty of his death as the ones who did. And that's where we see the magnificent work of God. The magnificent work of God. The Bible makes it very clear that the death of Jesus was, was not a tragedy in the traditional sense. It is tragic that mankind was so sinful that they crucified him. But this was not some accidental thing that happened. It was the will of God that Jesus died on the cross. Jesus went willingly to the cross. This was the work of God planned and established from the beginning to redeem mankind so that all who believe might be saved. Because there was a problem, and that problem is our sin. From the time when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, the inclination of people has been toward evil. The man, the image of God remains, but is marred and hard to see through the stain of sin. At the time of the flood, the Bible says that man was so evil that God regretted making mankind. And all throughout history, countless evils have been done. Even in civil societies, sin persists. Oftentimes it becomes integrated into the culture and celebrated as we see all around us. All it takes is a cursory glance at the Ten Commandments to see how fall short we fall. Beyond that, examining all of God's statutes will show how very far we are from the standard God has set. Romans three nineteen through 20 says this, Now we know whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may become si subject to God's judgment. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the, not through, the knowledge of sin comes through the law. One of the things that people often say, one, one of the common responses you'll get if you ask people, what does it mean to be a Christian? You, you, you go to church, you try to believe in God, you try to follow the Ten Commandments. You try to do the right thing. The Bible is very clear. The purpose of the law is to show us God's standard, but also to show us how much we fail to live up to God's standard. The sin that we have separates us from God, and God is holy and righteous, and because of that, He punishes evil and sin. And because we are evil and sinful, we are deserving of punishment. Romans 6, 23 says this, for the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. Wages is a word most commonly used to express that which you've earned. You go to work all week and you get paid the wages that you have earned. What we have earned from our sin is death. And that could be the end for us. God would be just to punish us for our sin but I want you to notice, if you'll go back to that verse for a moment, I want you to notice that verse, that there's a comma there. That means that sentence is not over. That means that this verse is not over. There's another part to this verse. And because of that, there is more to be said. So we'll see the rest of this because we see God's love in this. We go to the, the next part of it. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because of God's love for us, He decided to make a way for us to be given, forgiven, to be made right with Him. He made a way for the wages that we've earned to be forgiven, the debt we owe to be paid. This is the fullest meaning of that favorite verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world in this way, He gave His one and only Son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. He did not do this because we deserved it. He did not do this because he had to. He did this because of his love for us. Sometimes the simplest things can be the most profound. The, the children's song, yes, Jesus loves me. Those are some of the truest words you'll ever speak. And it doesn't get much more profound than that. Why did Jesus die for you? Because he loved you. And, and it's not because he, he wanted, there was anything that was appealing in us to this, but, he, but just because of his love. If you look at Romans 5, 6 through 8, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
The ones that mocked him, the ones that cried crucify him, the ones that are listening to, to Stephen proclaiming this sermon are the people that Jesus loved and died for. And if you think of your worst moments, the worst sins you have in your life, the, the furthest you've ever been, the most rock bottom you've ever hit, God saw you there and still he loved you enough to send Jesus to die for you. Not some otherworldly idea, but for you. And this comes to the heart of the message. Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus took the punishment that we deserved. And in the Old Testament, there was a, a sacrificial system. We've heard of this, and, uh, but I want, I want us to look at this for a moment. We know the reality of the system well, even if that seems a little foreign to us. When something wrong is done, there has to be a price that's paid. If you break the law, you go to jail. And that's essentially what the, the Old Testament sacrificial system indicated. There were sins of the people, and God made a way through the sacrifice of animals to cover that sin so they might be forgiven. And, and so each year on the, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would sprinkle the animal's blood on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. This was the, the Ark of the, Co the Covenant was the physical symbol of God's presence with his people. And the lid was called the mercy seat. This was supposed to be where God sat and from where he would show mercy to the people when the blood of the sacrifice was sprinkled on the seat. They show, this showed the gravity and the weight of their sin as there was blood that would be shed, but it also showed the grace and mercy of God as it was not their own blood as was deserved. Although the Bible is very clear in Hebrews that, that this, these sacrifices could never really take away sin, and this is why Christ came. Romans 3, 25 through 26. God presented him, him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the former sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. Now in verse 25, some, verses might, some versions might say propitiation. That, that God presented him as the propitiation by his blood. It's the, the, those words, the, the Greek word used there, both, both words are right. But it's the Greek word for the Hebrew idea of the mercy seat. That Jesus is now the one who is interceding. That Jesus is the one whose blood would be the atonement for sin. But not only that, he is now also our high priest Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice provided by God for our sin, that his blood could be the atonement once for all, that he might be the high priest interceding between mankind and God as the high priest would have done in the older days for Israel. He intercedes for us, but not by the blood of an animal that can never take away sin, but by his holy and precious blood that covers and pays the price once for all for our sin. So that once and for all, the sins of all mankind can be paid for, and we can have peace with God through the blood and work of Christ. But that's not even the end of it. On the third day, Jesus rose again, demonstrating God's victory over sin and death. Jesus now sits at the right hand of God, interceding for us. We serve a living Savior. This is why death has lost its sting just as we, Christ was ra raised, we will live eternally with him. The death and resurrection of Jesus are inseparable. His death was to atone for our sin, but it is through his resurrection that we know this work has been accomplished. This is all the work of God and God alone. And we have had nothing to do with it other than being the ones that God has loved. And the result of the work of Christ is our salvation. It's important to understand that this salvation is a free gift that is available to all who will believe. But it is a gift that must be received by faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9-13 says this, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness and confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord 
will be saved. So what does this mean? Because of God's love for you, because of what Jesus has done for you, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, who will, who will believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, can be saved. Because God loves them and made a way for them to be saved. But, there, but apart from this, apart from believing in your heart and confessing Jesus as your Lord, there is no way of salvation. Otherwise, Christ would not have had to come. If trying harder, being a good enough person could get you to heaven, there is no need for Jesus. He came because He is the only way of salvation. As we read earlier in Acts, there is no other name under heaven by which man may be saved. And so that's why it's very important that we figure out how we are responding to the work of God. We must identify in our lives how we are responding to the work of God. In this passage, we see a very good example of how not to react to the sin that's in our life. You see, these people, the Sanhedrin and those listening, were confronted with their sin, very clearly shown that they were just like their ancestors, doing all of the wrong things, following something other than God, and they killed the Messiah. But when they heard this, what's their reaction? They were enraged and they gnashed their teeth. And when Stephen says that he, he sees the, the, the heavens open, he sees the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God, they cover their ears, they rush at him, drag him out of the city, and stone him. They doubled down on their sin, and they refuse to acknowledge their wrongdoing. And in doing so, Stephen becomes the first martyr of the church, dying for his faith. And let me tell you something, it takes a lot less fortitude to kill for something than it does to die for it. You see, they were willing to kill because they thought that they were doing no wrong. But Stephen was willing to die for what he believed because he knew that the promise he had in, in the work of Christ was sure. He was not afraid to die because he knew where his hope was. So that's the wrong reaction. And it doesn't have to be that extreme. We see it every day where people will hear the good news, they'll hear the gospel, they'll hear of God's love for them, but rather than repenting and turning to him, they'll reject it. They'll go their own way. They'll say, that's not for me. I'm glad you believe that, but that's not for me. And it's the very same result. They have rejected the one who's loved for them, who has loved them, who has made a way of salvation for them, and they remain dead in their sin. So what is the right reaction? You see, Peter preached a very similar message to the one that Stephen preached in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. But at the end of this sermon, when they heard this, this is Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the, the apostles, brothers, what should we do? The correct response, the only response that we can have when confronted with our sin is to be convicted by it to acknowledge the truth of what God's, what God's Word says about us. To look and see, here is God's law, here is God's standard, and I've clearly broken it. Not to be mad about it or mad at the one who has brought us this message, but to acknowledge, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. What am I supposed to do? And the Bible is very clear about this. Believe in Jesus. Believe that He's the Son of God, that, Christ, that God has raised Him from the dead and confess Him as your Lord and Savior. Stephen's message to them is the same message every person must face in their life, that you are a sinner, and that you need salvation that's available because of the blood of Christ. So the question I want to ask you this morning, how have you responded to your sin? How in your life have you responded to the work of Christ? When confronted with the reality that according to God's standard, you are a sinner. You are guilty. What have you done with that? This is something that only you can do. Your salvation is based solely upon how you have responded to your own sinfulness and what Christ has done for you. It is not based upon your family. It is not based upon your outward appearance. It is not based upon the outward things that you do, like those who heard Stephen's sermons base their relationship with God. It must be based on nothing else but the work and blood of Christ. This means that you have been confronted by and understand your sinfulness and need of, need of a Savior. 
You have believed in his death and resurrection. You have believed in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead and confessed him with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. This is the most important decision you can make in your life. And if you have done that, from there you should follow in obedience in baptism. You should join in a church body to fellowship and follow Christ together and grow in your faith. And you should be living and active in your faith every single day until you achieve that promise that we have in Christ. But if you've not done that, if you realize and you look at your life and you still see, then you know that you're guilty of sin, that you've never trusted in what Christ has done for your, your redemption, I implore you to turn to God today. He loves you. I would urge you to respond to and be saved by the work of his love for you. Jesus died for you personally, not as a concept. He died for the sins of the world and that included yours. He knows you. He loves you. He desires that you would turn to him. The, the song that, that Julie sang earlier, his eyes are on the sparrow. He knows you. It was not a mistake. When I, when I say Jesus loves you and died for you, that's not talking about someone else. It's talking about you. So in a few moments, the altar is going to be open, and I'll be down front if you'd have a need for prayer or to, to talk about anything. But what I would challenge you with is whatever you, wherever you are, whatever is going on in your life, take the ne next step of following God in obedience. And if you know him this morning, I would implore you, turn to, if you don't know him this morning, I would implore you to turn to him this, today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day you've given us, this time that we can just look at your word. And God, I pray that you would give us boldness like Stephen to confront those who need to hear the gospel. That we would be people who would be willing to proclaim and to preach in the face of adversity and difficulty. And God, I pray for those who are lost. Those who are, those like Stephen's audience, those who are hearing the gospel and are opposed and are in their sin still. God, I pray that anyone we preach to would be willing to hear and respond. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who does not know you this morning, that their reaction would not be to, to grit their teeth and to, to stay firmly planted, to double down in their sin, but that you would pierce them to their heart, convict them, and that they would turn to you today. And God, I pray that you would help us all to be people who live a life that is glorifying and honoring to you, that everything we do would glorify you and lead others to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope this sermon has been a blessing to you today. If you have any questions about what you've heard, we would love to hear from you through our church Facebook page, email, or by calling the church office.